Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm going to make sure you can all hear me. Yes. All right. Let's um, get this party started. So we have a couple minutes, but I'm going to just try to adjust my monitor here and get our guest speaker on because I'm excited. I have a pen and paper and I'm ready to rock. So let me get our very special guest on here so that we can bond. Bye. Hello. Yay. How are you? Good, how are you? I feel like that scene uh, in The Hunger Games, <laughs> when they're, they're trying to select people and you're like, I'm gonna bring my guest. I'm like, I nominate me. I'll be tribute. <laughs> I'll be tribute. Pick me as tribute. Oh my gosh. So as of one minute ago, we had 99 people registered for this webinar. What? That's yeah. amazing. I know. I guess so, it was a good idea to offer free alcohol. I, I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's no Mine free alcohol. Oh, we're just kidding. We're just kidding. <laughs> Mine is chilling in the fridge. I'm not kidding. I had my day started at about 6:45 this morning, and I've yes. had meetings after meetings after meetings after meetings so wow. it's been interesting but what we're going to do we're going to whoever comes on comes on that's great but everyone who registered will get the link to the recording once we upload it on youtube okay um so there's that uh we have a lot of things going on here people we're going to get started in like t minus two minutes why do i feel so warm um <laughs> maybe because i've been rushing i had an um, instagram live at five o'clock a phone call at six o'clock and then literally at five minutes to seven i had to get my contract over to my publisher for my next book before seven o'clock and i got it in wow then I had to just grab something to eat and run back upstairs that that's amazing yeah you so are getting it all done getting it all done so everyone this is my last thing for the day <sighs> i'm just and saying hello to everybody in the chat hello yes. hello Yes, I hope everyone. I, where are you I, from? <laughs> I think everyone's using panelists as opposed to panelists and all attendees. Yes. So please, okay, yes, Carlina is using everyone. Okay, Carlina, you're from Mississauga. She was my six o'clock call. Carlina's awesome. Nice. Um, other thing, if you have not registered for your ticket for the Biz Mixer on Saturday that Carlina's hosting, you want to get on that. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so oh my goodness, my, my, my aunt is on the call. I can't do my shenanigans. My aunt is on the call. Now we're in trouble. Aunt, please excuse his shenanigans, please. <laughs> I need to witness them. I don't want her to tell my mom on me. <laughs> That's the key here. That's no matter how old you are, you're still afraid of your mom, right? That's one of oh, those yeah. things, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh my yeah. Gosh. She's physically stronger than me still. Oh, wow. <laughs> She knows how to use those chuppels and slippers. She knows. She, yeah, she knows. Dodge, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Um, so everyone, I want to first throw out there that if you know me, you know that I very rarely have men do our presentations on our platform. And I think, Bob, you're the second. Okay. I'm honored. First in terms of webinar, but the second in terms of just the platform as a whole, like at our live events and everything. And that is because Bob has some things to tell you that you will need. I mean, I had a, what, a half an hour conversation with you <laughs> yeah, yesterday? yesterday. Yeah. And I, like, I've already downloaded TikTok. I've already registered <laughs> for the website you told me. I already registered for the Facebook group that you told me about. Like, I was just, oh. like, jotting down mental notes. I'm like, oh my God, I'm excited for tomorrow. So make Good. sure you Bye. have pen and paper because I have a whole book here ready and my <laughs> pen and I'm going to be taking notes because I am determined to up my presence and my mm -hmm. level of expertise. So mm -hmm. I am going to stop speaking. I'm going to hand the floor over to Bob. I am going to run the deck. Bob, if feel free to say next slide, you know, anytime, but I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. And please, you can pop your questions in the chat box or in the question box. Bob and I will be able to see them. Bob, I will try to field them as we go through as well. Just <laughs> Thank, you. Going. So, Thank you. So, yeah. 
it's all up to Bob now. No pressure. No pressure at all. I, I have to start by saying I'm really grateful that um, you took this opportunity to give me a chance. And the reason that this is so important for me is I grew up with a single mom. And I remember what it was like for her to be employed and a self-employed entrepreneur. So whenever I can give back to communities like yours, I'm so, so grateful because I know that there are many, many amazing women that do work similar to me. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, just a, a quick little note. Uh, what I tend to do is I tend to go through the presentation and I know that I'll probably get an alert here or there about a question. But if I missed your question, uh, please know I believe we have 60 minutes for today or probably 55 now. My presentation probably won't take longer than 30 because it's really important for me to leave a platform available for all of you to ask individualized questions. So surely I can broadcast everything I know to you, but I want to make sure there's time for you to ask specific questions about what your experience is and allow me to answer them for you. Because I really would love for you all to take something home or you're already home but to take something offline that you can start working on right away so i just wanted to start with that as well um but uh ready okay here we go uh so today we're really going to talk about how do you go from that really beloved local leader in your community to becoming that online expert or for you know let's say influencer that that's that's recognized nationally regionally globally um, because that's really important. What, what tends to happen is we sort of get caught in our circles or our ecosystem and we're, you know, we're really happy, but we don't realize how much opportunity that we're missing by not leveraging our expertise online a little bit more. You'll notice my presentation is more about business uh, comments or business sensibilities than it is about actual technical terms. So please don't worry if you feel like you're not uh, a tech savvy person. That's not what this presentation is about. It's more about giving you direct tips that really any one of you should be able to apply uh, right away and see the benefit of it by doing this online. So why don't we move to the next slide when you're ready. So uh, I want to make sure that we establish your expectations for today so you know what you're getting. So we're going to make sure that we can talk about how to identify your signature expertise brand and we def we call that marketability so how do we know what is marketable when it comes to your expertise then we're going to talk about creating recognition oh, i may have made a misspelling mistake my apologies uh we're going to then talk about creating recognition as an industry expert and that's when we go from marketability to establishing your credibility and then we're going to sum up by talking about some really simple search engine optimization techniques that you can apply so that you actually get visibility online. And again, I promise I won't use any sophisticated terms. And if I do, please call me out. I'm happy to make sure that everyone's on board with where we're at. We'll go on to the next slide. And this one I know, cause it's all about me, but just so you get a reference of who I am, my name is Bob. I've been an entrepreneur for about 17 years. And my biggest claim to fame is when I had my first business in 2008, I earned 250K in our first year. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot in 2020 standards, but in 2008, 250K in a year's revenue was pretty good as a solopreneur. But the key here is I did it all without ads, meaning that I went and I tried all of these techniques to build my expertise and to let people know that I was the go-to expert in that business. So everything I talk about today, I promise you is not theory. Everything I talk about today is all practicality, things that I know work because I've tried it and I've done it really well or I've done it really poorly. So I'm just gonna give you the stuff that works really well. Why don't we move on to the next slide then? So let's talk about this idea of marketability. So when we think about our knowledge, our leadership, when we think about how people know us, that really is a brand. And I think a lot of us come from a perspective of a brand being something that has graphics and is a large corporate conglomerate, but individualized, especially in 2020, when it comes to a relationship driven economy, you are your brand. So the key here is to really understand what that is. Are you known as uh, the local community leader for women? Are you known as the local expert when it comes to SEO? So really understanding what your brand is, is, is key here. And that typically starts with doing a bit of a review, really taking stock on how do people uh, reach out to you? Why do they reach out to you? What's the most common question you tend to get asked? So a little bit of inventory helps you really understand if your brand is really a brand. And I say that because 
sometimes we're known for things that aren't necessarily marketable. So that being said, you know, my dad was known as the go-to, he was the local accountant that could always find ways around getting you a great tax refund. And I would tell him that although that's a great brand, that's not exactly something we can market because <laughs> you'll have Revenue Canada knocking on your door saying, why are you the one that gets around all our stuff? So the idea here is to really establish that with some self-reflection. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? So when we, when we talk about understanding what our brand is and we're doing that self-reflection, we're also thinking about who our audience is or could be. So we do that using certain business terms, which I call the demographic, well, I don't call it, it's called demographics and psychographics of your uh, audience. So the demographics are just those statistical characteristics of what make up your audience. What's their gender, their typical age range, What's their education level? Really start thinking about those of you that have a community, what's the typical demographics of your community? Those of you who have knowledge or an expertise and you're just getting started, think about who could benefit most in terms of demographics from the knowledge that you have. Are you able to have amazing impact on women over 50? Are you able to have amazing impact on millennial young men? So when you really start understanding who your knowledge helps and you really draw out that uh, demographic of them, and again, these are just characteristics, it gives you a sense of, of what your brand could look like. But we also need to understand what the psychographics of your audience is going to look like. This is really all about personality. How do these people think? What do they feel? What's important to them? A third thing I slip in sometimes is this concept of value graphics, which talks about religion, culture politics. So you really want to get a sense of these characteristics, both demographically, but also their personality. Because as you're really figuring out who your brand helps, who your expertise helps, who your knowledge helps, you're basically drawing out a typical audience member. Those of you who already have a community and a following, you're already set. You're just looking at who makes up your audience. I'm going to give you a little tip that I got from a mentor a long time ago, which works really, really well. Typically, your knowledge and your expertise and your influence has the most impact on an audience member that's most like you. And if you think about it, it's most like you were maybe four or five years ago because you've gone through a transformation. You've gone through some kind of change that your expertise has gotten you through. So when you're really figuring out, Baba, I don't know the demographics and psychographics. I have a wide variety of people. Well, then start with a reflection of you. Who were you two or three or five years ago? And how did your knowledge help you? And think about that as your audience. You're trying to help those people build or, or get to a, from A to B based on the knowledge that you have. Let's go on to the next question. And I do see some questions in chat, so I'll come to them soon, I promise. What's the, am I spelling stuff wrong today? Goodness gracious, I'm sorry. Uh, so when you're doing this uh, measurement of demographic and psychographic and you're building this idea of who your audience member is, the next step you want to take is what is the specific problem that they're experiencing that your expertise or knowledge or influence can help them overcome? Now, I want to clarify one thing here. In business, we usually use this term pain point, and that's great. But sometimes your knowledge or your expertise is really about pain or vision, meaning that you're helping them get through something which is painful, or you're helping them get to a place that's visionary. Maybe they've never thought about traveling. Maybe they've never thought about having an amazing, loving relationship. Maybe they've never thought about having their youngest child who they love actually achieve university. Sometimes it's not about pain, but about vision. So really understand when you've drawn out your demographic and psychographic, what is, what is that particular problem? But draw out about four or five things. So let's say, let's say you say to me, Bob, I really want to focus on helping women in business in the Peel region area which is great. So what are the challenges they might have? They might be challenged by not being in a place like Toronto and they're missing opportunities. They might be challenged because uh, maybe Peel Region is a very expensive city to live in and it's really hard to start a business there. So think about all of those elements that make up their challenges or their visions, right? And really define five of those problems and come to one. Come to one problem that you know your expertise, your knowledge can solve. And if you're having trouble with this, by the way, those of you who already have community members, ask them, say, hey, Jane, uh, Tanya, 
what's going on in your community? What's going on in your life? Sorry, what are you struggling with most? Why do you attend my webinars or read my Facebook posts? What is it about what I say or share really helps you? So organically, we tend to just share our knowledge because we, we love helping people. That's why we get into the work that we do. But we don't actually take a measure of well, what problem am I solving? Ask the people that you've talked to in the past. And for those of you on this webinar who are just starting out, as you're building that demographic and psychographic of your audience member, try and think about someone in your network, your community, or maybe even in your family, that's a reflection of that. And use that person as a sounding board. Hey, uh, Jane, I noticed that you, you and I have a lot in common. I'd love to ask you, what are your struggles in business? Or, or where do you struggle when it comes to raising your kids? It's amazing feedback. It's amazing knowledge that you can get. Do you mind if we move to the next slide? So the next step you're going to do is when you're honing in on the marketability of what you do, understanding the demographics and psychographics of your audience and understanding what their particular pain point or visionary point is, you, you really want to find an answer to that. And once you've found an answer to that, once you've talked to people and they've said, you know what, um, Jane, you're absolutely right. This is a problem for me. And I notice you talk about it online and every time you do, it helps me they experience some sort of uh, transformation. So the key here is once you figure what that marketability is, we want to now establish your credibility. So this is something you could do all on your own online. And the key to starting this is what are the key words or key phrases that make up your expertise? Now, this is a really interesting exercise because essentially what happens is you're thinking to yourself, well, Bob, I help people in this way and I help these type of people do this but those aren't really keywords. Keywords are, how would someone like Jane, who you know is your ideal audience member, how would she find you, right? What would she look on Google for? What would she search for on Facebook? How would people refer her? So a keyword could be, um, a keyword could be menopause. Maybe Jane is over 50 and is starting to experience these health symptoms and it's impacting other parts of her life. Uh, maybe Tom is 45 and he's just gone through a divorce. So maybe his keyword is divorce. So understand what those keywords are. And I'm going to show you next how those keywords are important. And when you ask your ideal audience members that you already have or that you need to find, uh, when you ask them how they search for you, they're going to give you a slew of words. You may not have realized a really good example is when I was doing search engine optimization, I thought people were searching for search engine optimization because I figured Search engine optimization is what they need. So I tried this exercise and I asked 10 small business owners, if you needed my help for search engine optimization, what would you search? And you know what they told me? They said, Bob, I would search for how to get found on Google. <laughs> Nowhere near the key phrase I thought they were looking for. And it's obvious when I say it out loud. So keep that in mind of when you're establishing your credibility, we need to start with what are the keywords or key phrases that make up your expertise that people used to find you in their own language. We'll go to the next slide. I'm going to interject before we go to the next slide. Yes, please. Yeah. Do not think of the words if all you have to do is check your monthly report that Google sends you because they usually mm -hmm. break down what people search for in order to find your website. That's wonderful. You're absolutely right. That's a really great point. Um, and for those of you that don't have Google Analytics, you can do the same thing on a Google My Business account. So think about setting one of those up. They're free. So as we're continuing to establish your credibility, we've now ideally defined these keywords or key phrases that people are searching for. So now here's where the fun begins. Now what you want to do is you want to create content that's, that not only helps your ideal audience member resolve a pain or reach a vision, but you want to sprinkle those key words and key phrases throughout your content. Now, I'll just be clear, content can be as sophisticated as a blog post or as simple as a Facebook post. Content is all about reaching your audience using those keywords and key phrases. Sometimes people use a multitude of strategies, right? They make a blog, then they do a video on YouTube, then they might do an Instagram post. Heck, even a hashtag could be a great way to share your information. So content is all about creating topics or interesting uh, shares or value posts that resonate with your ideal audience. Again, resolving a pain or helping them reach a vision, right? So, and, and content can be any one of these forms. Uh, here's one suggestion I would give you. When you're establishing content for your ideal audience, another question to ask them is, hey, 
how do you consume media? And I know that sounds a bit like funny to ask people, but you want to find out like, are they spending a lot of time on LinkedIn? Do they spend a lot of time on Pinterest when they're on Facebook? Do they love the videos or do they prefer photos when they're on Instagram? Are they doing Instagram stories or Instagram TV? When you understand how your ideal audience is consuming social media, that's the only place you want to be. So when these social media experts tell you to be on 52 different social media channels, it drives me nuts because if you really are connected with your audience, because again, the audience is generally a reflection of you, you only need to be in one, maybe two places to get their attention for them to easily find you. So determine what platform they're spending most of their time on and create content there all the time consistently and consistently is the key here. Um, but wh why don't we move to the next slide, sorry. So part of establishing his credibility is you, you're now putting out these expert posts or these knowledgeable videos and it's sprinkled with keywords or key phrases throughout, but you don't just put stuff out and walk away. You want to create conversations. When, when you're creating content, you're asking questions or you're polarizing. The thing here about being an expert in Canada is as Canadians, we suffer from this disease called humility. And the challenge with humility is it doesn't get you noticed. Now, I'm not asking you to be dramatic. I'm not asking you to be way out of your comfort zone. What I'm suggesting is when you have knowledge or expertise or when you know something, when you're really confident in information that you have, you want to get, do you, I don't know if you know how excited I get on webinars. I get sweaty and I use all my hands. I, this is polarizing because I get so excited about the topic. That's what you need to be to get noticed. So if you create content and you sprinkle it with keywords, if nobody's watching or if nobody's reading, it's not going to serve you. Pick a side and share your knowledge with no shame. Put it out there what your beliefs are. And certainly you might, you're going to attract people that love it. You might attract people that challenge you, but that's what it is to be an expert is to be polarizing and getting noticed and creating conversations with your ideal audience, with other experts or with, you know, in communities like this one. Can we go to the next slide? To continue to establish our credibility, we're also looking for opportunities to speak to your audience, the idea, ideal audience that we've defined earlier, or creating videos to speak to them or garnering testimonials from them. The reason why I bring this up here is to establish credibility, you really need to get noticed, as I said in the previous slide. So what I see happen is this. I see a lot of local leaders who have a friend or someone else local who has a podcast or who has another friend in the town over that has a, an event and they speak at that. See, the thing here is you could speak and be on podcasts every day of the week, but if it's not your ideal audience who's, who's listening, it doesn't serve you. So instead of trying to get on a thousand different podcasts or getting a ton of speaking gigs for free, really hone in on what are the events my ideal audience is going to go to, whether it's locally or maybe it's in the US, like where are they going to spend time? You know, one of the great gifts that we had with everything that happened with COVID-19 is we've had an entire series of communities move online. So look for those online opportunities to speak to a group, a networking group. Um, but also keep in mind the podcasts that you get into, the blogs that you participate in. Don't just accept every willy-nilly invitation. You really want to focus on the ones where your audience is spending their time, right? Where they, Because again, they're a reflection of you. So you have that opportunity as well. When you're starting out, if you're, you know, going for random opportunities here and there, that's not actually going to hurt your SEO. That's okay. But as a solopreneur, as starting, you got to be mindful of your time, your energy, and your credibility. Because if they, if you get, if you get bagged as the person who will speak anywhere for free, that's a reputation that's hard to break out of. You want to be known as, I need the person that knows everything about my CRA issues or my credit report. So I'm always going to call Tanya. Tanya is that person. I'm always going to call her and never be afraid to attach a fee to your opportunities, even if you're starting out, right? If you're nervous to attach a fee, always look for some kind of reciprocal opportunity. So as an expert, there's a bit of authority there. You never necessarily want to give everything away for free. You always want to have some sort of reciprocity. Maybe it's you get to email the list as well. Maybe it's that you just believe in the cause that's there. Maybe that you sell at the end, but you know, you always want to make sure that you've established this boundary of I'm doing this because there's some sort of return on investment. Okay. Shall we move on to the next slide? 
Okay, now let's get into the juice, the visibility. So we've established marketability. Who is your audience going to look like and how can you get in front of them? Now we've established credibility. Where are the opportunities that I need to put myself and make sure that people uh, are seeing me as that go-to expert? Now when it comes to visibility, I wanna talk about three key assets you can use to really build your search engine um, juice, if you will. So the idea here is you always wanna have some kind of website. Now, I don't want you to think you need a huge sophisticated website. You could use something called Google Sites. So if you go to google.com slash sites, you can build a drag and drop website completely free. Of course, you could do the same thing with Wix and Weebly, but you are taking their branding as well. But the point I'm trying to make is a website acts as an anchor. I see a lot of knowledge leaders build entire brands on their Facebook page or on their Instagram account. And what I always ask him is this, you can do that. But do you guys remember last year when Facebook went offline for 10 minutes and the internet was on fire? Imagine spending all your time cultivating and building your audience on someone else's platform and it shuts down. Or worse, you get hacked. Or even worse, they want you to start paying for it. So really be mindful of a website as your own asset that for the most part you can control. Again, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. It could be a simple one-page site that says, hi, I'm Bob, here's my logic. Uh, sorry, <laughs> here's my knowledge uh, and here's how you can book me and get to know me. And then maybe have a couple blogs or videos that really share that knowledge. And again, there's lots of free places you can establish websites uh, for free, but I really want you to get into the headspace of this is my anchor. This is where I'm always going to send people. I'm always going to send traffic. For those of you that have a bit more tech savviness, this is where you can create um, landing pages, email opt-ins, five-day challenges, there are so many ways that a website can help further your expertise brand. Can we go to the next uh, slide? The next asset I wanna talk about is this idea of citations. So some of you under the age of 45 won't remember this, but I grew up in a time when libraries used to have the Dewey Decimal System. I don't know if you guys remember the Dewey Decimal, zero point, no, 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 it was a whole thing. There was card catalogs and everything. Don't they still well, have that though? Uh, I don't think, I thought everything is digitized now. Do they still have the Dewey Decimal System? Well, I think when you go to the library, you still have to look for all that stuff on the shelves with the system. No? Maybe, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking of my, like, I go to the Innisfil and the Berry Library. There might be, but usually what I'll do is I look it up on the computer and it'll tell me which section it's in and I just look for the title. Oh. It might still be there. That's interesting. Wow. Well, yeah. obviously I haven't taken a book out of the library in a very long time. <laughs> Oh, it's still alive. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so I've embarrassed myself. So I am not an expert in the Dewey Decimal System, but it is still alive. So the point I was trying to make is this idea of citation. So if you remember Dewey Decimal. So when it comes to building your online brand and getting visibility, citations are simply records, of, uh, records that reference you. So a good example of a citation would be a database entry. So if you're part of a chamber, uh, typically when you join a chamber, you get to join their membership directory. Well unbeknownst to you, that actually creates a citation on Google. And the more citations you have, the more juice Google will give you. So I encourage you to look for opportunities like your chamber database. There's lots of free databases. I wonder, does, um, does your community have a database that women can- I used to have a free database, but it was taking so much to manage that I stopped okay. it. It's a lot of management to keep it active. It is, it is. So what you could do that is you could search, just do a Google search for free business database. And you'll find lots of really, and actually even better if you can find ones in Canada, because the more regional your database entry is, the more Google gives you juice. And a database entry is simply your name, your business name, and your business address. Now the business address is key here. Citations are based on the accuracy of data, which means that when you put in your business address and your business name, it always has to be the exact name, the uh, exact way or the exact style in every citation. So I'll give you an example. If you enter the word road and then another citation you put RD, it doesn't actually translate. So you want to make sure that those citations are exactly the same as we go throughout. I see a lot of people offering advice in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love that you guys are adding to the conversation. You may find I'm going to address what you're saying in the next slide, but that's okay. Keep them coming. I love it. Uh, so yes, yeah, citations are all about uh, Google seeing you as that reference point. So free databases, maybe even paid databases. And, and again, make sure your information is the same. 
I have seen, I have honestly seen small businesses outrank Walmart for certain keywords because their citations were more on point. So citations are an amazing asset that you can build and they're easily, easily found. And there are ones that you can pay for as well, but I would start with the free ones. Can we go to the next slide? The final asset I want to talk about is this concept of a backlink. So all a backlink is, is whenever your website is referenced on another website, it creates what's called a backlink. So Google sees that, hey, Jane's website has referenced Bob's website. We're going to give Bob a little bit of juice for that backlink. Now, this is really key because if you can find backlinks on websites that your audience visits regularly, that's a huge, huge value for your Google ranking for you to get found for those key words we talked about earlier or those key phrases. So uh, an example might be contributing as a guest blog. You know those content posts I asked you to create? If there's someone else with a website that's willing to share that content as well, that could really, really, really help you. I'm going to give you two little tricks that I love to use for backlinks. So there's two websites I want you to check out. One is called Haro, H.A.R.O. It stands for Help a Reporter Out. I want all of you to sign up to that free newsletter right now. And what will happen is every day they send you a list of different opportunities for press professionals uh, to reference you, to, to garner your advice or to be included in an article. So essentially what can happen is if any one of those press, press professionals pick you and use your con contribution, they will do what's called a backlink. They'll reference you back to your website. This is extremely powerful because some of these people write for entrepreneur.com, for Forbes. They write for huge publications and that's a lot of amazing juice that you can get. So that's one website. The other one I love to use, it's a smaller community called Spot a Guest. Now this is run by a friend of mine named Mark and what he does is he makes, he creates opportunities for you as experts to connect with podcasters. So if you wanna start getting on podcasts where your experts, uh, sorry, where your audience lie, that's a really great database where you can just look for those opportunities. And the best part is once your podcast is published on their website, they can include your website in the description, which again, gives you a backlink right to your website. So it's amazing, amazing, amazing. Those two are amazing website resources to use to get a backlink. So uh, just to reiterate, a website is really, really critical as an anchor. Citations, get yourself entered into databases using exactly the same information on each one. And backlinks, make sure you're getting referenced by appropriate and credible websites back to your website as well. Can I we move on? One little yeah. question. Please. I feel like I know the answer, but I just need to ask it. So yeah. I contribute to Peel Daily News and they do print, right? But yes. they also do upload it on their website. However, they don't do links. On so the website? Can, yeah, on their website. Like if I want to pull up my article, I will type in my name in the search box and mm -hmm. it will come up. But they like that doesn't count as a backlink for me. Right. Do, do they have a part where you can enter author information? Do they give you author, an author, author information? No, it'd be like, I'll get a byline, but again, it's not linked because I think they just up, they upload, like, I don't know if it's a PDF or whatever. They, you, you're able to flip through the paper online. Oh, They're yes, yes, yeah. So that's tricky. Yeah. So a lot of traditional community papers don't have that technology to do that. It really comes down to asking, right? Asking them saying, hey, um, and I'm not sure where they would put it if they have some kind of digital part of their website where links can go live, but it doesn't hurt to ask whoever you submit articles to, Hey, I'd love to get a backlink from you guys. Is there any way that, is there any part of the website where you can reference me as an author, like my author bio? Okay. So that could help. Right. Oh, uh, another, th another thing that might be fruitful is ask them for a testimonial and, um, put that testimonial somewhere on your assets and that in turn can help as well with credibility. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So here's the rule. You can find your audience, speak to them on podcasts and get as many backlinks as you want. But if you're not committed to consistency, if you're not doing and spending at least, at least three hours a week on this process alone, you will never find success because Google is constantly looking for new and fresh things and your competitors are breathing down your neck. So you really want to make sure that you're committing to this consistency of a social post, looking for a backlink, 
uh, some sort of activity that's moving the dial on getting you recognized online. Okay. And I think the last slide is just my info. Uh, but that's why I left so much time. I want to be able to really, Oh, I always say do one thing. So if I put a lot of information in your head and you're like, Oh my goodness, this is so much. I'm going to ask you one thing, promise me one thing that helps me sleep at night. Just do one thing you saw on this presentation. Just pick one, start on that. And it's amazing the momentum you can gather by using any one of the techniques you've seen here. Cool. All right. So I was hoping, I was hoping if you're okay, that we could like, just open it up to questions. I, I think we got like 22 comments in the chat. Yeah. And, and I want to make sure people can get their thing. Oh, their okay. I'm going to go back and try to do, do some questions. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. So, uh, can you repeat the second, the second website? I think it was spot a guest. Was that the one? Yeah. So S P O T A G U E S T dot com. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, sorry, guys, I'm trying to scroll up without really losing everything. It's quite a bit. Someone snuck in the QA. Nice to have a cheap website when you're just starting up or wait until you can afford a professional one? Oh, great question. So, you know, a website is a key asset that you're going to need to get found online. So, here's my logic I often encourage people to create, to start off with a one page simple website. It just needs to have your, now this is assuming you're building an expertise brand. Uh, it just needs to have your information, what you talk about, uh, how people can reach you, and maybe some blogs. So it doesn't need to be sophisticated. And you could use google.com slash sites as a free tool or Wix or Weebly. Um, as your business grows and evolves, then I would suggest investing in, in evolving your website. But you see here, the, the thing here is there's this presumption that we need, you know, a $5,000 website with SEO to get found on Google. We actually don't. We simply need consistency. So I would suggest starting with a simple one pager. Wix and Weebly will even give you templates that you can just use and put in some pictures and words. And that's more than the other thing I would suggest that does add to credibility is when you get uh, a one page single website, I do encourage you to invest in a domain which means like bobminhas.ca because when you tie the domain to the single page website, it gives you more SEO value. But number two, when people use an email like boblovesbusinesses at gmail.com, it's really hard to build an expertise brand around a Gmail address. So when you get a domain, you can actually get a bob at bobminhas.ca address. So it really helps establish your credibility. Um, in reference to the website question, I can tell you, I started with a free WordPress blog style site. Nice. I selected like the Times newspaper format and I had my one page blog and then I created a couple of other tabs where you can contact me or, um, and I think events. And I had that for about two years before I had my actual website. So Wonderful. it is very helpful. Just ha you just need a site. You need yeah. someone to send people. Yeah. Um, I see. Isn't Wix awful for SEO though? That's what someone's at. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. So you know what? You that historically you're right. Wix and Weebly were horrible for on-page SEO, and what's happened is over the years, it because they've got drag and drop uh, templates, it makes it difficult for Google bots to really um, read a lot of that content. But now, uh, I've done more experimenting with Weebly uh, now and, and a little bit with Wix. Now what you're finding is you can add components on on the back end for that. That being said. Uh, your blog is really what drives your SEO capability. So you could create a Wix template and the on-page SEO may not be as strong as you'd want it to be. But when you create blogs, that's what's going to drive the SEO, right? So you were right. I'm with you 100% like two years ago. I, I knew Wix and Weebly were horrible, but they've improved. But don't stress too much about that. It's more about whatever content you create like blogs. That's going to bring in people to your website. Um, someone's saying that they registered a website domain name, now receive emails to register to Google search engine, and they're charging upwards of $200. Is it a, man is it a mandatory thing to get registered or, uh, for visibility on Google search? That's a spam email. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> so whenever you register for a domain, and if anyone ever says you have to pay money to get on Google, unless they're selling Google ads, 
unfortunately, we, we I get a lot of clients who say, Bob, I've got this renewal notice, but I just bought my website. So that's spam. What I would highly suggest is wherever you bought your domain from, just because I'm not, I mean, I'm an expert, but I may not know every domain. I would check in with the provider. So if it's GoDaddy, I'd email or call them and say, hey, I got this email. Is it accurate or not? So I would check in with your provider, but at no point should you have to pay Google to get on Google unless it's an ad itself. Yes. Um, how would you recommend leveraging backlinks when you're a guest on a podcast? I love it. So whenever you do a podcast, they usually put what are called show notes. So in show notes, which is outside of the actual podcast, which usually includes your name and, and what you do or whatever, what the podcast is about, those notes, you want to ask them to include your website. So, hey, Jane, I love doing your podcast. Do you mind including my website in your show notes? In other cases, if they're using YouTube, you can put it right into the YouTube uh, post itself. They can include it there as well. Okay. Um, I, yes, the webinar recording will be available. I will send it out to everyone probably by tomorrow. It's going to be on our YouTube page. Uh, I'm going to, yes, it will be available. Um, nice. What are your thoughts on writing a book to gain authority? Yeah, so authorship so there are five main ways of gaining authority in, in where we are right they're speaking authorship podcasts uh courses and consulting so authorship works really 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 well but it always is about two main things number one what are your objectives and goals it's really difficult in today's market to earn a ton of money from selling a book but a book helps you establish credibility to get into one of the other assets well it's whether it's speaking whether it's podcasting so the Books can be a great compliment for that as well. The other thing to consider is the audience that you want to help, the ones that you love, that you know you can transform, do they read? Because <laughs> right? I'll tell you, I'm not a reader. I'm an Audible guy. I love Audible. So whenever I meet someone who says I wrote a book, I'm like, oh, <laughs> is it on Audible? You know? So uh, always be mindful of how your audience wants to consume your expertise as well. Okay. Um, what are your, no, is it better to grow organically or invest in ads? Oh, great question. So, uh, it, so there's two main things to think about here. It really depends on the scale of how much you want to grow. If you're saying to me, Bob, I'm on, uh, I met a woman the other day who was on maternity leave. So she's like, I only have nine months. And so nine months I said, yeah, it makes sense to use ads to definitely grow your um, search engine capability or your fees of, um, visibility. The reason why I like organic is this. When you're starting out your business, as perfect as you think your business is, as you start taking on clients and speaking, you're going to iterate, right? You're, you think like when you start a business, you're like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It never works out this way. I've been doing this for 17 years. You think this is my expertise. And as you start talking to more people, you realize, well, maybe that's not so much my audience. Or you know what? I want to talk more about this. And so when you invest money in Google ads from the beginning, it's a bit of a crapshoot because unless you stick with those keywords and key phrases, you have to restart again. And typically you need a good six months for momentum to see, sorry, to see momentum from any kind of SEO or ad strategy. So uh, if you need to scale fast, that's a great, I would do it. But I, I prefer organic because in the first six to eight months of your business, you're still really figuring out what your hone, your focus and your niche is, right? Um, so next question is currently my website is my name. Do you recommend migrating it to a domain name that is more SEO friendly before you answer that question? Yes. I'm going to say the person's name. Okay. Or, better yet. I'm going to say, I'm going to attempt to say the person's name. Okay. Yawande Fado Jutimi. Okay. That's good context. <laughs> so yeah so here's the thing domain names have value for seo so i would come at it from two ways number one if you want to continue to use your name as the website domain you need to start building your name in all of your brand and seo in, in fact it becomes an seo key phrase in your strategy so you know i'm going to use a simpler name i'm sorry so for example book with bob right or or um, get clarity with Bob. So when it becomes part of your actual brand, certainly it makes sense. The other thing to consider is, you know, a domain name that's more 
SEO friendly in terms of the English language is a lot more powerful because you can reference it based on outcome. So what I see is someone says business coaching with Bob.com. Everyone's got business coaching, but Bob.com. But if you had something along the lines of transform your life today.ca, you are reading into the pain or the vision points of your ideal audience and, and Google grabs that for SEO value. So it actually works to your advantage. Uh, that being said, migrating a website is a pain in the butt. Here's what I would suggest. I would use some keyword or key phrase research, find out what it is that you really want to be known for that your audience is going to find you for register that domain. And you could do what's called a domain forward, which means that you simply forward that domain to your website. Now, if you do this once, it's okay. But if you register several or like 10 domains and forward them all, Google doesn't like that. They're going to be like, this is some kind of spam <laughs> pyramid scheme and we got to shut it down. So if you do it for one, it's fine. And it saves you the hassle of migrating, right? The other thing to consider is, and if I'm too technical, I'm, I'm sorry, you can private message me. But when you do a domain forward, you can also do what's called a domain forward with masking, which means that if I have bobminhaus.ca and I register business coaching with Bob, it can forward and then people will only see the business coaching with Bob. Now, the drawback is, if you have individual blogs and pages, they can't reference it. So there's always a give and take, right? Before you do any type of migration, I would look at first, are you branding your name or are you branding an outcome of either a vision point or a pain point? And then start with the domain forward. Over time, let's say, give it six to eight months. If you're noticing that that domain is getting way more SEO traffic than your name, then make the migration. Then you can totally make the migration and then just leave your name sort of in, in uh, it, as a park status or even a domain forward the other way. Was that too technical? Was that okay? I feel like that was okay. Um, she okay. was saying her ideal audience are immigrants from her home country. So maybe her <sighs> name would be, more, would be more popular. I don't know if it's a common name because I mean, I'm Jamaican, but I only know myself as being Duenia. Yeah. I don't know any other Jamaican who, who's Duenia. So, you know, it, still seems like it would be a good idea to have that other option. I think having both options, a domain, a, a .ca domain is, you know, 10 bucks for a year. It, it doesn't hurt to have it. It's always going to come down to talking to your ideal audience and, and saying to this immigrant community, if you know what I do, how would you search for it? Here's the catch. And I'm glad we brought this up. They may not even use Google. Mm -hmm. They may be, like, I know a lot of, uh, old, and I'm a South Asian, my grandma, she would throw her shoe at Google. She'd be like, I'm not using that witchcraft. So, but, so her frame of reference in terms of how she found things was, was uh, referrals. So everything I'm telling you here today is built on the digital strategy. If you study your audience and they say, we don't digital, we don't care. It's not anything. You've got to really be mindful of that. And then you've got to build a strategy that feeds into how they get their information. They might still read the newspaper. They might still listen to the radio. So Certainly digital strategies are great in 2020, but there are still markets that aren't using it. So. Um, if I have registered my business under my personal address and then use a PO box for my audience to see, do I have to change an address to be consistent for citations or can I be consistent and use my PO box moving forward? You, you can certainly use your PO box moving forward. Now just keep this in mind. When you registered your domain, and you put your address, do you recall putting it as a private label? I ask that because domain registration is public. Anybody can access domain registration. So if it has your home address, it might be a bit risky. But, I think she uh, might have just meant for her business registration, like her business license. Oh, no, you're right. Nope, that's okay because mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily get referenced online. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. She said she did a private label. Okay. Yeah, and even that, so that's fine. So yeah, site so a, let's say GoDaddy. A GoDaddy registration doesn't work as a citation, so you're fine. Now, just keep this in mind. Google, in general, especially Google My Business, hates P.O. boxes. They will honestly lock you down if you're using a P.O. box. So there's only mm, two ways around it, really. Number one, if your P.O. box is a UPS store, they're the only provider that does sweet numbers. Yes, do sweet numbers. So I, so I haven't heard Google catch up to this hack yet. They may soon. The other trick that I like to use is I find a co-work space in my community. And typically co-work spaces charge 10 bucks a month to use their address. 
And so co-work spaces are a physical brick and mortar entity. Google loves that. They will give you so much more juice when you're using a brick and mortar address. If you're using UPS store, they'll be like, oh, okay. But if you use a PO box, I've literally heard of accounts getting shut down because they don't want PO boxes being used. In terms of citations, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've registered in other places, it's fine. But in terms of citations, they don't want to give that juice. It's the physical address that gives them a reference point that you're a valuable person, for lack of a better word. Okay, so who is the best domain provider in your opinion? Oh, someone's also asking what's a citation, but this one first. Who is the best okay. domain provider in your opinion? Uh, I'm biased. Uh, I like GoDaddy, and I know GoDaddy has a bad reputation. But there's one criteria I use to pick vendors. It's customer service. If I can call a number 24-7 any day of the week because my website's not working, I will go with that person. All of these other providers like Hostpapa and all, they're great, but they start off with email-only support or only available, right, of uh, phone during business hours. I need to look at, if it's two in the morning and my website's down, I wanna be able to call GoDaddy and I can uh, to get something fixed. So granted their reputation on the other side of the business isn't that great. I only care about customer service. That's sort of, that's sort of my name. Okay, web names. So if web names has great support, I love Canadian. So if web names is a Canadian company with 24 support, 24 seven support, that's how I pick domain providers. That's it, right? And keep in mind, again, I'm going to get a bit technical. Keep in mind, wherever you register your domain, if you register a .ca, you get caught under what's called the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, the CIRA rules. It's different than if you register a .com. The only reason why I bring that up, guys, ladies, I should say, is if you register a .ca and you get into trouble, I find CIRA is way more helpful than the uh, .com registration domain authority. They are just inundated. I've never had a, a, a case solved with them. Whereas with CIRA, if I've had someone squatting on a domain or what have you, they're really, really, really helpful. So I, I, you know, I know people say, well, .com, .t is not recognized in the US. For me, it's all about support. I want that I can call and get help. And then when something's wrong, I can call. That's how I pick my domains at the end of the day. Well, a .t yeah. You could get both. <laughs> you could get both. Yes, get both. But a dot com, a dot ca, a dot org, a dot biz, it doesn't really have as much impact on domain as, as you would think. It's more about the content of the website. Um, someone wanted a refresh on what citation. They might have joined a little late. Yeah. So citation is, is simply a database entry somewhere online. You could do it with a chamber. You could Google free business database. And every time you enter your business information into some kind of database or directory, the more that Google sees it, the more juice they give your website. Now here's the caveat. Every citation entered must be exactly the same as the other one. Meaning if you have like Garrison Road and then you put in another citation, Garrison RD, they won't line up. You must pick a format of information or if you're short forming or if you're long forming and that must, you must always use that format every time. Uh, what you can do is if you're using Chrome, I use Chrome. I don't know if it works on the other ones. Um, you yeah. can always save, um, you save your, I forgot what it's called. You can go into settings and you can fill out your business name and address so that you can oh, web forms. Yeah. You can save your web form entries. Yes. Yeah, You can just do all for that. Um, I see someone here, LinkedIn does not allow us to use our business name. I have a full-time job with the government and my business part-time. Do you know how I can use LinkedIn as a second place for my business? Um, I can, it, a personal page, because you can have a business page on LinkedIn. Uh, this is James. They call it a company page, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you can it. have a company page and you can have a group yep. with that name on LinkedIn as well. So maybe you should check that out. Yeah. So to your point, you, 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 you're right. Your personal profile on LinkedIn can't be a company name, but uh, you can set up a company page for free. And that's really good because when you enter your business name in the experience section, it references that company page. So it acts as almost like an internal backlink for lack of a better word. How does that work for the LinkedIn articles? Like, you know, you can write to your own articles. Mm -hmm. How does that work with your backlink? So in an article at the end where you put, you, you can actually put your website at the end part uh, where you usually put your signature or sign off. 
articles are great because articles exist. So posts are seen by your direct connections. Articles are exi exist, anyone can see them based on keywords and, and key phrases. So putting them in the, in the um, end of your LinkedIn article, the backlink is great. Um, but believe it or not, I know people will fight me on this. I've seen more juice on using medium.com as a backlink over LinkedIn, not because LinkedIn isn't powerful. Um, I, I've just, I've just not seen the traffic come from it as much as I've seen from medium.com. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, someone said they're trying to understand they registered with you, I guess you registered for your website with your previous home address and now relocated. How does that work when registering? Roxanne, can you expand on that question? I'm a little bit confused. And then we she, can. She, she registered with her previous address and now she's moved, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so then what would have to happen is you'd have to go to all your old citations and update it to the new address. Now, when you do that, you actually lose all the juice those old citations were delivering. It almost becomes like a reset to day one. Mm. So it, you certainly want to do it, but you know, just be mindful of, are you getting more value from that other juice? Yeah. Hi, Bren. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. I was a guest on Bren's show. Sorry, you were saying. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, it says, can I have a backlink on that slide? Oh, he's doing what, oh, he, he's doing what you told us to do. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Oh, he is wants it? a backlink. <laughs> nice. Oh my gosh. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about a lot of SEO stuff here, which is great. So as long as you guys know that this is all about building your expertise, but that's awesome. I am learning some things. I mean, I am working on books to try to, mm -hmm. you know, do all that working on podcasts, but I'm going to use that note to make sure that, oh, someone did ask a question, but. I apologize if I didn't get to your question because I'm scrolling up and down trying to see all the questions, but I do recall seeing a question about YouTube. So yes. if, let's say I have my own YouTube channel mm -hmm. and I am posting a video. Mm -hmm. Do I need to always backlink to my website in the description? Yeah, so what's interesting is um, YouTube is an incredibly powerful search engine because it's owned by Google, right? So YouTube, in terms of every video putting your website, yeah, you could use it as a backlink in that format. You know what? You know why I'm getting stuttering? Because my YouTube expert is on this webinar, and I know she's hiding because she knows I'm going to call her. Carol, are you here? Carol, let us know. Help oh, us I, think she, I think she snuck away because she knew I was going to call on her. <laughs> well, okay. So to answer the main question, yeah, you can certainly put your website link in the body of your video. Um, I, I, th I see more power coming from it actually being in the, the, the about us section of the YouTube as well. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when I think about YouTube, so now you've got me really thinking because when you use YouTube, it's already embedded in its Google code. Uh, you know what? I'm going to tell you, here's what I would do. Google is more powerful with key phrases and keywords than it is a backlink. You can try and get a backlink it won't do you as ju much justice as keywording and key phrasing the videos itself. That will get you way more ranking than any single backlink. Now, that being said, if someone else, someone else's YouTube video uh, puts your website link, like a podcast, for example, that has, that has immense value. Yeah. Okay, great, 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 great. Um, oh my gosh, our time is pretty much up. Doesn't no. It is it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I told you he has a lot of information. Uh, does it make sense to pay GoDaddy or someone else to do SEO services such as writing articles? Mm. So um, it's all about time. Uh, to me, I'm at a place now where I have a VA. I write the blog, but as you can tell from the way I present, I verbal vomit it. And she actually puts it together with keyword specific things. So in my opinion, if you're building your expertise brand and you don't have a lot of experience with key phrasing, it is worth investing in a virtual assistant to just do those things for you. Actually, is Helen on the webinar? Helen is my ghostwriter. I wonder if she's here. Helen, are I've you lost all my friends. <laughs> is Helen here? Oh my gosh. They all left. They're like, we're tired of hearing Bob. Um, 
so yeah, to your question, it does make more sense. You wouldn't invest in GoDaddy because I know GoDaddy offers that stuff. You would really look at Odesk or Fiverr or in this community, in your community, there's probably yeah. virtual assistants. A lot. I, I, Maria, you said, how do you find a virtual assistant? It's so easy. There's so many of them out there. However, yes. before you send me an email to find one, you <laughs> need to write down exactly what you want from said virtual assistant so that yes. you're getting the right one that, you know, is going to do the job. Yeah. Yeah. I I know a lot of them. (laughs) So yeah. So if you can find a virtual assistant with copy experience, that's what you're Mm -hmm. looking for. And you want one that understands, understands key phrasing. You know, if you're looking overseas, you really want to make sure that English language is strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's worth the investment. Now keep in mind, again, as I say, you could do that. It will take a good, I'd say three to six months to see momentum from that. If you're starting from scratch. So if you're worried about making that investment, you can do it yourself. Just, you know, keep in mind for your blogs to be impactful, you want them to have that keyword or key phrase uh, built in. Perfect. Uh, Someone wanted to make sure you said media.com. That was the website that you had mentioned earlier that you said it gets better traction than LinkedIn. Oh, uh, medium. Sorry. M E (laughs) sorry. M E D. Oh, I'm not going to spell it right. Medium. I U M. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Dot com. I got you. So medium.com is a really great, so I still suggest LinkedIn articles for sure. But if you're not sure if your ideal client's on LinkedIn, medium.com is almost like what I call the people's paper. There's a vast array of, of ideal audiences, like so many different kinds on medium.com. And I like medium because as you start building a following there, even though I've told you to use your website, uh, you can monetize it. Medium.com will pay you if you get a lot of people reading your stuff. Yeah. So there's a little bit of monetization that can happen with your SEO. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, everyone, well, wait, I'm trying, what kind of ads should you start with if you're new to ads? Uh, in terms of Google or Facebook or are they asking? Um, Carlina, do you want to expound on that? I don't know if it's, if it's uh, for Google or Facebook. I mean, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think when we're starting, uh, especially in this expertise path, I'm a little hesitant to invest in ads because you're usually going to spend the first six to eight months really honing in on your expertise and on your message and your clarity. So I generally prefer to see organic growth. Again, as I said earlier, if you've got a short window or a short runway, I found the, you know, if your ideal clients on Facebook or on Instagram using Facebook ads is helpful. If they're on any other platform, using Google ads is helpful. It really depends on the outcome in your audience, right? That's, yeah, that's I why. tried, like I started doing some Google ads this week and I'm not going to lie to you. Like there's a lot of reach and clicks, but no conversion. But then yeah. when I do my Facebook ads, which so much cheaper and Instagram ads, yeah. Yeah. more conversion for sure. So. And keep in mind, both Google and Facebook are currently offering Facebook ad, sorry, ad grants. Yes. So look for those grant opportunities where you can test out ads without you losing money on it as well. Yeah. Cause I've spent quite a bit already. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough, right? It's tough. And that's the thing is ads get easier when you're honed in on exactly who you serve, what your message is and what your outcome needs to be. Mm-hmm. You, you get way more um, value or return on investment on ads in that respect. Perfect. Well, Our time is up all. Like I said, I will send out an email with the link to this webinar that's going to be on our YouTube channel. In the email, I'll also have Bob's information. In the show notes, I'll also have Bob's information. I'm learning. Yeah, thank Um, you. (laughs) Love it. And, you know, so that you can reach out to him, please reach out to him. He is a wealth of knowledge. I mean, you see all this that just happened, right? He has more. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so he is available to you. Um, if there are any questions, Bob, they can find you on LinkedIn. They can find you on Facebook. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> you can find him everywhere. I think either Bob's frozen or I'm frozen, but thank you very, very much for, you know, joining us today. Uh, yeah, he's back. Okay. He, I can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. My internet cut out. Thank goodness. I have a backup internet. <laughs> my one wi Because my internet cut out before we started. So I had, to, I just tethered to a cell phone because I said, I can't have this not like, yeah. This so nonsense, yeah. you can bid your farewells. I told everyone how to find you LinkedIn, Facebook, and that I will uh, definitely send out your information. 
And I just want to put something out there. You know, I, I always believe in the mission that, that group, communities like you are developing or delivering, as I said earlier. I want to offer this. If you feel stuck or you want clarity or you just want to talk to me, please send me a direct message. Please reference this webinar that you were on this webinar. I am happy to contribute 15 to 30 minutes to really help you get a little bit clearer on one component of anything we've talked about today. That's my offer to you. Thank you. Of course. You guys heard that. You better message him now because he's a busy man. Okay. Yeah. Have an amazing. She's always saying that because I took like two weeks to book a call. <laughs> I'm so bad. <laughs> it's okay. We're both busy, but busy is good. Yes. I'm yeah. going to drink my canned wine that's in the fridge and start <laughs> writing the book that I just signed that contract for today. So. Oh, that's impressive. <laughs> Don't forget the rest of us when you're famous, right? Don't forget the um, rest of us. I bring everyone with me. And whenever Love. anyone says stuff like that to me, I usually quote Tupac. It ain't no fun if the homies don't have, can't have none. Ah, oh, I love it. I love it. I'm going to reference that. Said that. That needs to be a hashtag. Everyone with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. So right. thank you. Webinar for the month. Uh, check out our website because we do have our conference coming up next month. Oh. We only have... As of this call, I believe we have 14 early bird tickets left and early bird tickets are free. Get it now. <laughs> right. Impressive. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.